assigned a plot. But everyone's assigned a plot. And so it's a, it's a space that's run by a committee. And the, and the community members don't want plots. They want to, to, har they want to uh, grow and harvest together. And then to give that, that food away together. Um, and for them, it's part of community building, right? But there's, there's, it's a, it's a hard sell to foundations that that's what may be needed if we're going to turn these, turn this system around. Well, has there been an effort from the, the council? Like, like, why not? When, when is it coming? Why not reinitiate the conversation with the Annenberg Foundation and that $16 million fund that they put up for the South Central Farm? Well, maybe the South Central Farm is not going to be that, that space, but you can impact the community. Because my experience is that I'm a donor and a donee. You don't get unless you ask. And I would like to see the Food Policy Council be more ambitious because you're the smart folks in the room. We trust you to do the right work. But you've got to ask on behalf of all those schools and all those community groups that are the non-traditional funded. Yeah. There ain't anyone else in the room that's doing it like you. So, yeah. so the urban the urban agriculture group, working group of the you know, so we're not sitting on the Food Policy Council, although we have members who are. Uh, we have three teams. So one is a research team, second one is a policy and advocacy team, and the third team is development team, and that's exactly what they're looking for, is to is to look into where can we get big, you know, big bunches of money. Yeah. And I'm on the development team, so you can best believe I'll be talking to you at the end of the panel. <laughs> <laughs> but one of the challenges I see, you know, we haven't talked about this much yet, but, you know, uh, the, the group is made up of a, of a bunch of nonprofits, and we have to come up with a protocol about when is a lead, you know, Glenn's lead for the LA Community Garden Council, or Dart's lead for the Social Justice Learning Institute, or the Food Policy Council's lead for the Food Policy Council work. You know, we'll have to work that out. I think that there's differences, so, yeah. I just want to say, Paula Zarola is here. She's in our group, and she's the head of the research team. Yeah. So. And that's yeah. been one of the great things that has come out of convening in this way has been how much all of the growers are wanting there to be better facts mm -hmm. about how much, how yeah. big each garden is, what facilities are in that place, you know, how much is produced. You know, we never, I, I, at least I never thought that was really important to gardeners, and now we're learning that it really is. People really want the data. Yes. yes. <laughs> this is what I'm trying to make the plug for. It. Your community garden, there is no, we do not know in Los Angeles City, in the county of Los Angeles, how many community gardens, uh, how many, how many um, acres are being cultivated? 0.7. And how? I've got 0.7 for you. I don't. No one's done since. No one's done a census of this. Yeah. And how many households are gardening? I mean, it's sort of like we just don't know. We know about more or less how many gardens there are, but we don't know how much is being cultivated. And so you can't make an argument one way or the other if you don't have the basic facts. So we're doing a census of the community gardens, and it's gone. Uh, a notice has gone out to all the lead contact people that we have for the community gardens, the, about the 80 community gardens that are out here. And we've had sort of a low response, right? Um, but uh, we're going to be calling all those people now since, uh, since we've gone the email route. Um, but anyway, so that's just some of the basic stuff that just needs to happen to find out what, how much is being grown, and then at a later date we'll find out, well, who actually are the people who are growing? Are they people who are just, um, you know, are unemployed middle-income people? Are they people who are low-income? Are they um, food stamp people? I mean, like, who's growing the food? And uh, so anyway, the, we we need to like, collect this basic information in order to make an argument about how we're going to change things. So, when you hear about the census. Please respond. <laughs> and, and how much money Please you respond. can ask for? Yeah. I see a provocative question back. Yes. You, yes. Uh, just a little provocative. <laughs> uh, you know, I'm seeing pondering in this idea that uh, uh, making our presence felt in front of the LA City Council and trying to get them to listen to it. And I'm wondering if it even makes sense to try to talk to the City Council. Because when I look at other issues that are brought before the Council, such as excessive density of, of construction in the, on the west side, Many people are upset that they have no impact because
because of the way that the gerrymandering of the councilman's district. And do we really need the city council on our side? Can we not circumvent that? I understand it would be nice if they would listen, but maybe it's such an uphill battle it's not worth putting our energy there. If we could get the funding elsewhere uh, from foundations or whatever sources it might, you know, wealthy people who, who, who look at things more our way. Uh, because let's face it, the city council would like to see another Walmart because they get taxes from that. They need to fund their civil service system in a shrinking economy. We're not really on their into their game at all, and we're only going to undermine what they're trying to do. I like that question. Okay. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, I happen to believe that you need two approaches. You need a bottom-up and a top-down approach. And um, change does not happen in ju with just one, right? And, um, or at least it's not sustained with just one approach. And so um, I think one, you know, part of what the policy and advocacy group will be working on is thinking through strategically how they can go about um, engaging political leaders in these conversations, right? There are some that are already supportive. Um, and then there are others who are less supportive publicly because they are facing these issues around the budget. And this seems like extra work. I mean, it really, it really does, right? So, you know, for example, in Inglewood, we, we do a lot of work with our, our, our um, policymakers there. Um, and we were able to, um, there was a Hill initiative that was passed in the city. And uh, a part of that Hill initiative was to, I'm sorry, Healthy Eating, Active Living uh, initiative that was passed in the city. Uh, sponsored by Kaiser. And this initiative calls on the city to uh, update its nutrition standards, right? To um, do a whole, to foster community gardens, to support farmers markets. And there's been very, there's been little to no implementation of that policy. Little to no, right? So in fact, let me, let me back that up. There's been no implementation of that policy. But we've been on the ground building support for this work, right? So we've been, in, we actually host and do food justice trainings uh, and we do a lot of movement building work with folk in our communities so that they can then go out and advocate for themselves. So when you talk about making our presence felt, the hour that I'm thinking about are the community members who are most impacted by that work. And it's really hard for policymakers to ignore 100 or 200 or 300 community members who are showing up at their office or at their front door or at, their, at the city council meeting saying, this is what we demand, these are our needs. But then there has to be a group of people who are working diligently to help transform the conversation or transform the minds of those policymakers and interact and, and also help facilitate some of those conversations. So I think it's, I think it's both. I think, I think you need multiple pieces in this change-making process in order to sustain uh, long-term change because there are policies that are preventing us from doing the very thing we're talking about doing. Yeah, exactly. I, 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 think, I think that what Dart says is, is right on. I mean, there is some willingness in the city. Uh, you know, they appointed uh, Paula Daniels, who's in the Department of Public Works, as I believe she's assistant to the mayor for food policy, right, or something like that. What is it, Alexa? You got it. Senior advisor. Yeah, senior advisor. Okay, so there's some willingness. It's not just the city council that we need to go after either. It's various. You know, we need to meet with the mayor and get us. You know, get his. You know, sort of. Uh, a general sense of strong support for the notion, if we can possibly get that. There are various departments. It's it's somewhat decentralized. So while the city council is important, it's, it's not the only actor. But I do think, um, as Dart was saying, that there are certain barriers on the books that we not need to get rid of. So an example is, it was an article in, in the LA Times about this uh, uh, maybe a month or so ago, about planting in parkways. So we have all these parkways around that could just you know, be feeding families, and um, instead they're under lawns, and um, and so you know. But there's there's um, you know policy that's preventing that at the moment. So there could be the possibility. Florence wants to say something. But anyway, the, so there there's certain kinds of uh, you know legislation that we need to get. We need to understand where the barriers are, and also where the advantages are. What what we can use in the existing laws and regulations that could be of our benefit, to our benefit. But also, I mean, I think in the spirit of what you're saying, which I love really, is um, that, that we don't have to sit around and wait for somebody to, you know, give us their blessing. We can move ahead with our own activities, as obviously you guys are. 
you know, and uh, so we can, you know, start growing wherever we can, form nonprofits, form, uh, form, do, encourage more backyard gardening, teach people, and and make it be a grassroots movement that they can't do anything about because there it is. Florence, sorry, you want to? Uh -huh. Yeah. Well, the Parkway Garden is a project of ours at LA Greengrounds, and uh, I started it with some of my students from last year, and I've long felt that we need to get to people where they live. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a master gardener, so you know we teach a community garden and in schools and so forth. But in South LA, there's really a need for more gardens, mm -hmm. really. And um, so I thought that we could teach at people's homes, identify somebody who wanted to grow a garden, and we felt that it would be sustainable at their house because they had a strong interest and they would have a commitment to maintain that garden. It would become a class, and we would ask those people to invite their neighbors because it's also a community building exercise. And um, so what we do is all of our volunteers is go in and we teach how to start a garden by actually doing it. And we bring all the materials. We do this all for free. So we're always scrounging for free materials. We haven't gone for a grant yet, and we've been putting in a, a garden a month. Um, and we're hoping that these gardens then become centers of getting the information out about how to, to grow your own food. Um, I'd like to increase the, the size of our of our organization to do this, and I know it sounds like not a great achievement because we're not sounds affecting right. policy, but that Parkway Garden that we put in attracted a lot of attention. Yes, it did. Luckily, because Ron got cited for it, yes. <laughs> so, it became a controversial garden, and uh, so we will be advocating for a change in the parkway ordinance. And I talked to someone in city planning who told me how to go about doing this to get the language to a councilman who is in favor um, of supporting this. So that's a, you know, you don't do it as a great group. If you do it little by little, you, you get the attention of one councilman. The councilman in the district of the parkway garden totally stonewalled us. He's not interested in talking to us or helping us at all until the reporter called him, and then he responded to the councilman's office said, oh, we're in great support of the <laughs> you know, What, what council member got, is that? Yeah. Councilman Wesson. Council member Wesson. Wesson. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and that was his support. He said, we will help Mr. Finney get a permit. Do you know that to get a permit to find anything other than standard plantings, which um, on your parkway is a four-inch turf or turf-like uh, plant? And, and if you do anything other than that, you have to apply for a permit, which will cost you at the minimum $400. Now, if you go on the west side, you will see these beautiful parkway plantings of roses and rosemary and you know, all kinds of gorgeous billowing plants that spill over the sidewalk that you're not supposed to, you know, and nobody comes down on them, and they're not getting cited. So it's not an issue of we're doing something wrong, and our vegetable plantings are, are well inside. But Ron's garden has fed his neighbors, it's created community because people will discuss, will start a conversation over food that's growing in the front. And so that's what we want to do is see more food gardens in the front yard. When people pass by, they start to speak to each other. And uh, and I think that is as important as growing food is growing community. Um, I've been participating in the meetings of the coalition for the, the community at the health council. Yeah, the community health council. Edna there recently. Yeah. And uh, they've got a coalition for food and they have another coalition for an active South LA, so they're advocating for bike lanes and pedestrian walkways and that sort of thing. Um, but I remember learning through them, and this has been sort of a job that he was doing. Them. Reggie Jackson, I think, who's in LA. Um, Real estate, he's head of LA City Real Estate, told us that they have lots and lots of vacant lots that, frankly, he said, cost us more to maintain them empty. They have to send tours out here. If some community group came in and started a community garden and would start maintaining that lot, it saves the city money. 
So why are we not going after the city and asking them to say something? I think one of the problems is we have too many spokesmen from this group, that group, that group, and we're not coalesced into a strong enough uh, you have to join force. our. You have to join our working group. Yeah. 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 I would like to follow up on that to maybe give some folks here some sort of action items. Um, what can your average community gardener, or maybe we've got a bunch of folks here who are sort of leaders in their community gardens, what are some things that you'd like to see from that community of folks you know, across Los Angeles do, um, and maybe even beyond specifically getting involved in a working group, but what kind, of, what kind of things would be helpful? Well, I have something in mind right now, actually. Anybody who is a constituent of Supervisor Mark Ridley Thomas's, uh, right now the LA County Board of Supervisors is going to uh, here, the Healthy Neighborhoods Ordinance, and one of the provisions of that ordinance is that a community garden will, will no longer need to obtain a major use permit in order to get started, which costs thousands of dollars to get. So in the city of LA, if you want to put in a community garden, you just put it in, there's no permit. And the county of LA is going to be like that in the future. So that's one thing I would very much like. Yes. How long is that going to take? It's pending now, it'll be like six months. You know, is that it could be adopted in six months if people like it, and if people are against it, they'll just like let it not be adopted. You know. Are you are you saying that there's going to be hearings that we yes. should show up at? Yes. So, um, okay. write, anybody? The, write the supervisor as well. Yeah. Let's call the supervisor as well. in support of the healthy ordinance. So the healthy Los Angeles. So maybe ordinance. if people, if we get your emails, maybe you can send out an email to everybody who's signed up, and so that you know, I think showing up at a hearing. Is more effective personally than, mm -hmm. than writing a letter because they can, you know, letter schmetter. Well, no, I, I think they're both very effective. Why, why Mark versus them? Why is it work on Mark? What's that for the story? Yeah, because uh, in uh, Supervisor Ridley Thomas's district, they have initiated a lot of community gardens. And uh, I think there could be a strategy behind uh, speaking to the other supervisors. But what I've observed is Supervisor Ridley Thomas will go with a large sheaf of letters or a large crowd, and he would have more uh, gravity when he speaks to his peers. He, he just recently gave a donation to the Garden Council. All right. Am I wrong? Uh, it was for building a garden, so oh, it was okay. like, you know, to his constituents. Right, but so <laughs> but, but someone who's in the sort of Garden Council's yeah. uh, network. But I think, yeah, your point is well taken. It would be productive to describe your support for the Healthy Los Angeles Initiative to any of the county supervisors. That's what it's called, the Healthy Los Angeles Yes, it's an ordinance, the Healthy Los Angeles Ordinance. So would that affect just county land or, or all the cities? Yes, yeah, only an unincorporated LA county. I know, I know. But you know, this is an example. It's really helpful, and I'll, I'll tell you why. Um, because LA City is, is just one city in LA County, right? And so we're in Inglewood. We, we're not located in the city center, and we have our own elected officials. And so um, the more these things happen, county and in, in, in other cities, or countywide and in other cities, the more pressure it puts on the smaller and surrounding cities as well, which are also part of Los Angeles. And so um, I think we've been, we're very happy when these things happen because then it lends more legitimacy right. to our work. So the city of South, pa yeah. Paul this, wanted to add yeah, the city of South Pasadena, for example, has a very restrictive policy. You have to get a lot of permits to start a community garden there. Yes. Um, oh. Oh. This was in response to this okay. question. I guess. Yeah. Um, Glenn has um, the flyer there, but uh, one of the things that the gar LA Community Garden Council, the organization that, that organized the event today. Uh, that we're doing, and it's sort of parallel to what um, Edna is doing, but for all those community gardeners and urban activists, urban agricultural activists who want to have a forum where they can meet and direct their interests to the Food Policy Council, to the working groups, so that you have a, 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 a body where you can express your interests rather so that the information flows from the grassroots to the people who are having the conversations with the policymakers. We're forming this advocacy group. And the advocacy group is open to anyone who's interested in working on changing these policies, um, 
be they in the city of Los Angeles or in the county. And it will be a group that gets, that meets probably like quarterly and sort of pulls together these issues that are of importance to the different areas of, of the county so that you just don't have a few voices. It, it's more like a coordinating body. And so the concept is to have a planning meeting where the people who show up are the ones who sort of determine the, the direction of this. And, and so I think we could, it, we could sort of dovetail the work that, that, that um, Edna was talking about, collecting these, these, uh, the, these names. Um, we were collecting the names out there for the advocacy group. Several of you signed it. Um, Glenn has a sheet up here to sign too. Um, so we'll probably just cross list the, 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 the two, two groups. Right now. Yeah, you're advocating to city or county or both. It's, it's both. Oh. It's, so it's, it's, a, it's a voice. It's a voice for in favor of gardens. It's a voice for gardeners. Yeah. Yes. For what gardeners and farmers. Sounds yeah. like just like a, sort of an organizing body. But an organizing general body. General it's organ body. organizing okay, body. So, so that's what so that, that for us. So we need. Yeah, yeah. So so that when 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 um, the food policy council, the working group, has something that they say. You know, they need, they, they want, they have an issue that we can respond to it as a large body. Yeah. We can right. be the 300 people that will show up. This is or grassroots if democracy. We, or <coughs> if you have the issue of that, there are these um, um, parkways uh, that are, that, that councilmen and other people aren't paying attention to, you don't have a voice, then the body, the large 300 people, can then direct that issue to, um, yeah. Yeah. Um, I'd also offer another use for this is I get an uh, email from the uh, Garden Council website from a person who's in a little school garden out in the valley, way out in the valley, and they're like, they're going to take our garden away, and this person is a, normal, a regular gardener, you know, they don't have any knowledge about how government or the school district works. And just I uh, then I was able to email the school board member and just say I would like information about this garden. And just by asking for a briefing on the garden, they back off. You know? <laughs> so if we act as a body and it gives right. a little doorway for every little gardener to get in, it'll get rid of a lot of the small problems, and we'll just have fewer. I hope. Here's <laughs> <laughs> maker in chief. <laughs> yeah, today. So let's uh, let's have just a few more questions. I think we're getting done on this topic if people agree. Yes, ma'am. Okay, I'm a backyard gardener and an educator. So um, D'Artagnan's point of starting at the bottom and at the top, um, I battle both LA County and I go out and I teach in local schools. And I see the effects of teaching in local schools much faster than I teach, see the effect of going to the top and waiting for it to filter down. So in my backyard, I've got a half an acre of fruit trees. And the most common thing here, people come to see my water harvesting program. And the most frequent thing I hear is, wow, you're going to have way too much food. So there is an ignorance mm -hmm. that we have to address. Um, and adults are much slower to get it than children are. So I propose that a whole lot of what we need to do is to go to teachers and go out into schools and talk with kids, support our community gardens, and grow the body of citizens that will not accept this corporate control of America. Yeah, I, I, I second that. Um, I absolutely second that. It is because of our youth that we've been able to move as far as we have been, to be honest with you. When we, um, when we initially started this journey a couple of years ago, uh, we went, our, our youth were the, actually our youth were the ones who came up with the idea of starting a community garden. And so uh, we said, well, how do we facilitate that? And we went down to the local community redevelopment agency and they said, listen, truthfully, your goals are not aligned with ours. Our goals are to make money and you want to grow food? And we said, okay, all right. So then we went to one of the city council members, and he says, well, look, I can't get your land right now, but uh, how about you look into the, some other land that's available with the school district? We talked to the school district. They basically gave us about a half an acre of land or so. Uh, and then we broke ground. We, we built that garden. And it was – and, and what, but what really helped us in that work and what really just in general helps to move this forward uh, was the fact that our youth – 
were the ones out in front. That they were demanding, they were the ones who said, look, this is what we want. And it's really hard for adults and people to say no when youth are asking for something that's good for themselves, right? I mean, think about it, if you're a parent, I'm, I'm, I have a two and a half year old son. If my son comes to me and says, Daddy, I want a carrot, am I going to say no? Yeah. Absolutely <laughs> not, right? So I love it when he asks for carrots. And so it's the same thing, right? It, it works with our poly, it works with our leaders. It works with the parents in our communities. It works with the teachers. When the students are saying, hey, teacher so-and-so, I want um, to start a vertical garden, then the teacher goes, they get really excited. Even though our teachers have been beat up on, right? They've been bogged down by, by uh, standards reform and, and, um, and a whole series of issues that are facing urban education or education in general today. Um, and so when we're, when we're asking uh, our teachers and our, our educators to do more, right, we should be there to help support them in doing more and also encouraging them to do more uh, by working with our youth as well. So in terms of what, what, what we could do, I, I, would, I would again second that. I would, I would ask that, that you all do identify a school that you go to and teach. Just share your knowledge with kids, I mean with youth. Right? I mean it's, it's, it's amazing the, the impact and the effect it has on communities. So if you identify, if each and every single one of us in this place, 50 of us right now, identified 50 schools, we could cover a couple of school districts uh, in in the South Bay alone, right? So, something to consider. Yeah. yeah. So I'm gonna not. I'm gonna say something else. I'm actually gonna expose you. So, so Glenn came up with the idea. You know, so a slogan in a lot of the local food movement is food security. You know, so that everybody, you know, nobody should go hungry. Nobody should suffer from obesity and from unhealthy food. But another word that you can use that has more muscle behind it is food sovereignty. And I think that that's what we should be aiming for. In other words, that we control our food systems, that we aren't just at the beck and call of people with a lot of money and power and getting the government behind them to support them at the $75 billion level to force us to eat and to live in a way that we don't want to, that we don't feel is, un is healthy. So Glenn has been an advocate for food sovereignty, food sovereignty. <laughs> But that was really, no, no, I got to credit, I got to credit Irene Pena and for Hector Hardin is the one who was pounding on me, she's like, we must argue for food sovereignty. Yeah, so. yeah. And, and I think that really, I think Edna and Glenn, it really speaks to the point that everyone should have the right to provide for themselves, yeah. right? And currently we don't have that right. Right. I mean, you cannot, I mean, if you, if something happened, if a emer major emergency happened tomorrow, we're screwed. Yeah. Right? So we should have the right to take care of ourselves, and I think that's by and large what we're sitting here advocating for. Yes. Good. Well, uh, I bet these panelists will stick around for a few minutes of individual cool. discussions. Thank you very much.